McGrath to speak first. And Colin McGrath has been an SDLP MLA for South Down since 2016. He served in local government for a decade before that. In the Northern Ireland Assembly, he served as a member of the Education Committee. He's chaired the Executive Office Committee, scrutinising the work of the First and Deputy First Ministers. And he's currently a member of Stormont's Health Committee. And he has been the chairperson of the SDLP since 2017. So, thanks, Colin. Thank you very much uh, for that welcome and it's great to uh, be here and I want to express my thanks to the organisers of the event and the opportunity to participate in this. Um, these events are a tremendous opportunity uh, for sharing and shaping of ideas uh, and for developing stronger relationships and building up new ones. Um, it's also wonderful, albeit at times behind masks and socially distanced and with super sanitised hands, to be in the company of people again face to face. The importance, I think, of human interaction was lost during the worst days uh, of COVID. Uh, and I, what I can see is that we are regaining a sense of the value of such face to face interactions. And to do so in such a beautiful setting here as Coventry Cathedral, makes it a special occasion for me personally. Uh, Coventry being globally known as the UK's only city of peace and reconciliation underscores how fitting it is that we are all here today. And I want to begin my remarks, if I may, by acknowledging and remembering the contribution to peace uh, in Northern Ireland made by Austin Curry. He was a founder member of my political party uh, and it was people like Austin who sadly passed away this week that made such an immense contribution uh, to Irish history. That sit-in in that house in Tyrone to highlight the civil rights issues of the day spurred a generation and, a, and woke a spirit of rights and equality that lives on today. We are here today to discuss peace, prospects for peace 100 years on from the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Yet the contribution of Irish peacemakers stretches back many centuries and are known all across the globe. My hometown is Downpatrick, and Downpatrick was once the ecclesiastical home of Ireland, and it is the burial place of St. Patrick, St. Bridget, and St. Column Kill, the three patron saints of Ireland. And I mention this as the story of St. Patrick and his contribution to peace building is so important and it is peace building that has been at the core of my role and as an elected representative for the SDLP for nearly 15 years. If we consider how things have changed and evolved in the last 100 years within the island of Ireland, we see that it has been a century of contested spaces and contested relationships. The complexity of the Anglo-Irish Treaty 100 years ago cannot just be simplified into unionists or nationalists, or worse still, into Catholics and Protestants. It goes much, much deeper. Even within the nationalist community um, of 100 years ago, family relationships were put at odds because some supported the treaty and others did not. And that has rippled down to this very day. I note that the panel today is represented by a broad range of views within Irish society. Myself as an Irish nationalist, Chris as an Irish Republican, Emma as a unionist, and Jamie as a loyalist, and Marissa and John in between the referee. So you will have the chance to hear from a broad spectrum of views today and develop an informed opinion. When we look at the prospects for peace, I believe all of the opportunities and challenges we have faced and will face for the next 100 years, boil down to one very simple thing, trust. Peace and trust go hand in hand, and when they do, they build up peaceful relations. And to be totally clear, when I'm talking about peace, I'm not just talking about the absence of violence, but rather proactive, relationship-enhancing, genuine, positive peace. That's what I really want to talk about today. And before I was elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly, I started out, as many politicians do, uh, on my local council. And before that, I was a youth and community worker. And I would say one thing, we should never downplay the important contributions that councils and youth work actually make. They are dealing day and daily with the matters 
uh, that impact people in our communities and they make a valuable contribution. When I was first elected to Down District Council, I saw firsthand the work of my SDLP colleagues and what they had done to build up trust in the council. From the early 1970s, the council operated a form of power sharing. Now, the breakdown of the council was not 50-50. It wasn't even 60-40 or 70-30, but nationalists always significantly outweighed the number of unionists that were on the council. But what the SDLP did was to ensure that the chairmanship of the council, that the mayor was rotated. Um, even in one term of the council, the SDLP had the majority, but we still insisted upon having power sharing and rotating the role of chairman between nationalist and unionist so that we could create that sense of equality. And, and trust was earned as a result of that. And an interesting element of this was that those from a unionist tradition who were very much in the minority always felt that they were respected and included within that council. And I feel that the development of peaceful relations was being shown here at its finest. They were maintained good community relations in our area while across the north places were being blown apart and the legacy of that remains strong in my area. I mentioned previously that I worked as a youth worker before being elected to the assembly, and I loved that role. Um, young people are our future, and the example that we set for them as adults lives long into their own adulthood. Much of my work as a youth worker was about community relations and helping young people to learn about each other's cultures, their communities, and traditions, and to help dispel the myths that they were somehow or another intrinsically different from each other. And this helped to remove ignorance, to build trust, uh, and develop peaceful, sustainable relations. I worked with many young people who said that their participation in such programs was the only time that they had ever met somebody from the other side, from a different background. And the impact of such work on our current generation was and is immense. And I should say, we should never downplay that. We should enhance it. The last 100 years of partition have taught us that there are no easy answers to the issues that we face. And I'll correct it maybe by saying that there are no right easy answers. If we look at the issues that we're facing at the moment, such as the difficulty that many within the political arena have with the protocol as a direct result of the Brexit agenda that was pushed, the disconnect between those reeling against the protocol, those that are actually impacted by it, and those children who were pushed forward to hijack buses, to terrify staff, and deepen divisions within our communities, that difference is immense. Those within the unionist community feel betrayed by the UK government and unionist parties, and they feel that they cannot trust nationalism, the Irish government, or the EU. Trust is at an all-time low. Now, the easy thing to do, the easy thing to do is to beat the drum of fear, to rattle cages and to whip up a frenzy and to whip up the tensions. Such mob mentality has been all too prevalent on the island of Ireland and has caused many problems, but has never solved any of them. Genuine and positive peace building takes time and it's hard graft. Trust is not easily earned, but it is easily lost. When you have that trust built up in a community, it takes real work to take root and even harder work and time to see it bear fruit. What is needed now is authentic leadership. Authentic leadership is a process. It is adaptive to new challenges and at its core, it is trust. The SDLP has always stood up when leadership was needed. We've done the heavy lifting when it was required. It's not always been in our favor or our benefit, but we've done it because it was needed. It was leadership that delivered the North from the mindless menace of violence that had previously given her to breathe. It was leadership that developed and delivered the Good Friday Agreement. It is leadership that will do the hard work that will not deepen contested spaces and contested relationships, 
but will bring cultures and communities together and create that open space of mutual trust and respect. The SDLP has helped deliver peace as a crescendo to the past 100 years, and we will do what is needed uh, to put Ireland in a sound place for the next 100 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin, for such insightful words. Um, next, I would like to welcome Chris Hazard. Chris is the Sinn Féin MP for South Down since being elected into the position in 2017. He was an MLA for South Down between 2012 and 2016, and he was Minister for Infrastructure briefly before the Stormont administration collapsed in 2017. Since 2017, Chris has been the Westminster lead in Sinn Féin's National Brexit Unit, um, and he is the Sinn Féin MP Group Leader at Westminster. Thank you very much, Marisa, um, and to Mike and the board uh, of Rising, thank you very much for not just the invitation to, to be here today, but your very warm hospitality uh, since we arrived yesterday. <clears throat> Friends, in recent times there can be little doubt that Brexit has exposed the undemocratic nature of partition, not merely emphasising the historical reality of the political, economic and national domination of Ireland by the British state, but how partition in and of itself was deployed as a tool to sustain such domination going forward. In addition, the public discourse surrounding this centenary year of partition has illustrated the incorrigible, rotten legacy of that division of our country and our people. This was perhaps brought into sharp focus in recent weeks by the decision of Victor and Michael D. Higgins to decline an invitation to accompany the British monarch in marking the 100th anniversary of partition. When the story broke in the Irish media, President Higgins was on a state visit to Rome to meet with Pope Francis. However, it was the image of President head bowed at the grave of the Italian revolutionary theorist Antonio Gramsci that spoke powerfully to the cascading political and economic crises of our time. Writing from his prison cell in 1930, Gramsci famously observed that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Gramsci was, of course, talking about the 1929 Wall Street crisis, the subsequent Great Depression, which gave birth to a variety of morbid forces in Europe and across the world at that time. Reflecting on Brexit Britain and the State of the Union today, it's hard not to see similar morbid symptoms as COVID-19 has revealed the cruel, unequal legacy of Tory austerity, an economy teetering on the brink of a renewed crisis. And as Brexit continues to resurrect reactionary English nationalist forces, the asymmetric dynastic union creaks further under growing constitutional pressures. Following the global financial crisis in 2007, Britain has experienced the longest period of wage stagnation since the Napoleonic Wars, as a deep malaise has penetrated many aspects of British political and economic life. Despite being the fifth largest economy in the world, wages here in Britain have declined by an average of 2% in the last decade, in comparison to an increase of 6% across the OECD. One in seven companies now in Britain are also considered zombie firms, and corporate insolvencies are the highest they've been in decades. Despite this economic malaise, the last decade has also seen an explosion in executive salaries, the increased marketization of public life, and a prioritization of corporations of shareholder dividends at the expense of productive capital investment. So rather than investing in future development, investing in people, the British state has sold off revenue generating assets to pay down current debts, shrinking its future income base. The wealth of the British public sector has fallen by almost £1 trillion, equivalent to 50% of Britain's GDP since the crash. Unsurprisingly, after a decade of such self-defeating austerity, Britain has some of the worst public finances in the global north. Meanwhile, the state's retreat from the provision of public services and the mass sell-off of public housing has drastically increased the cost of living for many, many households. Rising utility bills, transport costs, and the eye-watering cost of childcare have eaten away at households' already stretched incomes. Yet at the other end of the scale, British billionaires won big during the last decade as greed, corruption, and wealth inequalities continue to grow. Nearly 50% of Britain's wealth is now owned by the top 10%, 
more than five times the total wealth owned by the poorest half. This decade of Tory austerity has been a social calamity and an economic disaster. Indeed, the harsh economic policies of successive Tory administrations have been described by the United Nations as punitive, mean, spirited and callous. Last year's Marmot Review, which assessed the social impact of a decade of Tory government, paints a vindictive picture of a sturdy Britain, a society where health inequalities have widened immeasurably and at least 120,000 excess deaths have occurred as a result of cruel austerity policies. As Gramsci observed, in these moments, each crisis of the old capitalist order doesn't merely threaten the dominant economic model alone, but the very institutions that govern society and politics also. Surveying the symptoms of this decaying system, there's no doubt that such a pervasive sense of crisis hangs over the Union and the British political system today. Young people in particular have been burdened with the wreckage of the political and economic system. Increasingly, they recognise that they have nothing to gain from the continuation of the status quo. Looking into the future, they see only secular stagnation and the looming climate catastrophe. The Union, of course, has always contained within itself three consciously non-English nations whose tectonic plates have long been drifting away from Westminster's central control. But there is unmistakable signs now that the traditional institutions of liberal British democracy are increasingly struggling to withstand the centrifugal forces eroding the economic and political basis of the state. With wartime solidarity and imperial glory, now a distant memory, the very concept of British identity has undoubtedly begun to recede. Being Irish, Scottish, Welsh and indeed English is what once again sets the pulse racing. Observing these dynamics over recent decades, the former BBC journalist Gavin Esler concludes in his new book on the Union that Britishness is dead and Brexit is both a symptom and also now a cause of the widening cracks in the Union. This erosion of the cords which hold the Union together has been quickened too by the lopsided nature of devolution, which has rehabilitated the spectre of English nationalism. Indeed, this deep-rooted alienation in England continues to nurture dissatisfaction, dislocation and anger against the constitutional settlement. This has led the political historian and journalist Andrew Marr to warn that left untreated, this constant grading of the Constitution will fray and splinter the Union. In response, the current Tory government fetishises the return of sovereignty to the British Parliament at every occasion, culminating in the ridiculous retort recently from the Leader of the House of Commons, Jacob Rees-Mogg, that fish are now better and happier for being British. The British government now deploys an assertive form of centralising unionism, constantly attacking the authority of devolved competences wherever possible in their ongoing strategy to level up as an alternative front against the rising demand for autonomy and self-determination in the devolved regions. This was starkly illustrated with the passing of the Internal Market Act last year, which empowered Westminster to unilaterally impose internal market principles in order to undermine devolved administrations. Wise to the constitutional consequences of such hostility, the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown has concluded in recent months that the choice for Britain is now between a reform state or a failed state. But Boris Johnson has a very particular plan for Brexit, Britain and the Union. It is a unitary state where power unquestionably resides at Westminster, away from the reach of the European Convention on Human Rights and the paternalistic hand of the EU nanny state. Johnson wants to create a bargain basement economic model where corporations would have the run of the place with low taxes, little regulatory oversight and privileged access to the halls of power. However, whilst England continues to vote for the Tories, rejecting the path of centrist social democratic European values, Scotland, Wales and the north of Ireland does not. In the devolved regions, a political consensus is emerging, a strengthening desire to repatriate sovereignty away from the Tories in Westminster. It's a process of transformation determined to build societies that are radically fairer, more equal and more democratic. Successive polls not only demonstrate growing support for independence in Scotland, in Wales and in Ireland, but an unprecedented groundswell amongst the youngest demographic. A YouGov poll in January of this year showed that 75% of Scotland's youth now support independence. Significantly, that same YouGov poll suggested voters in England are almost entirely indifferent to the fate of the Union. Of course, political philosophers have been observing the rise and fall of states and political unions for many centuries. 
Thomas Hobbes and Levithian expounded the internal diseases that tend to the dissolution of the Commonwealth. Nothing can be immortal which mortals make. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in his social contract, reached a similar conclusion. If Sparta and Rome perished, what state can hope to last forever? The body politic bears within itself the causes of its own destruction. Indeed, in the words of one of England's most enduring poets, Thomas Gray, the boast of herald, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth there give, awaits the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. So friends, 100 years after the partition of Ireland, it now seems inevitable that Brexit, amongst a variety of morbid symptoms, will be the catalyst for unprecedented constitutional change across these islands in our time. Such change is now a foregone conclusion. Only the how and the when remain mysteries of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, next, I'd like to welcome uh, Jamie Bryson. Jamie Bryson is a prominent loyalist activist from Donaghadee. In 2012, he served as chair of the Ulster People's Forum and became a leading figure in the Belfast City Hall flag protests. He is the author of books, Brexit Betrayed and the forthcoming Justice, Law and Human Rights. He is also the editor of the online site Unionist Voice and Jamie works in public relations and law. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and, and, and thank you to the organisers for the, the invitation uh, to come and, and speak here today. Um, as somebody who comes from a loyalist community within Northern Ireland, and uh, I'll develop this point in my remarks, uh, our community do feel uh, quite often that we're not listened to, we don't have an opportunity to express our views and we're, we're often characterised in a very negative way, um, even within the United Kingdom. Uh, which, which we cherish, so to be provided the opportunity to come here today and speak to you and, and the people watching is something which I very much appreciate and I know people uh, within my community will appreciate, so thank you for that. In developing these remarks, I'm going to uh, try and deal with uh, just over two decades of what's become known as the peace process in five minutes and, and Chris and uh, Colin went a little over the five minutes, but um, so if we start at the beginning, uh, 1998, um, the Belfast Agreement. Now, I want to say from the outset, I am ideologically anti-agreement. I oppose the Belfast Agreement, but I do not oppose peace. And you see, what happened in 1998 was this turn of phrase got developed called the peace process. And you see, what is peace? Peace is the absence of violence. So everybody who is a Democrat and everybody who is committed to peace must be committed to peace no matter what. And what is the process? Well, the process is what flows from the Belfast Agreement, a, a political text, uh, a piece of legislation in the form of the Northern Ireland Act. So therefore, if you follow the logic of that, the three is peace process means that you can't have one without the other. And of course, if you follow that logic through to its conclusion, then that means those who would threaten violence have a veto over the process. And that, for many people in my community, feels like what's happened over the last two decades. Well, unionism, because you see, we look at the process, and a process, by its definition, has to have a beginning, and it has to have an end. So when unionism looks at the process, the process has only one end point, and it is the end of the union. So participation in the process for people of my belief within unionism, and, and that's not everybody, there'll be people in unionism with different views, but for people such as myself, we believe that we are being asked to participate in a process which is designed to fundamentally, incre incrementally, little by little, dismantle the union that we cherish. I feel that's an act of self-harm for unionism, and that's why I oppose uh, the institutions uh, in, their, in their current form. Flowing on to that, we then come to a Brexit. Brexit was a vote uh, with uh, the whole United Kingdom, 17.5 million almost, voted uh, to leave. Uh, and we hear the argument all of the time that Northern Ireland did not have to give, con or did not give consent to Brexit and voted against Brexit. There's a very simple answer to that, and that is a gross uh, mischaracterization. Uh, when you're dealing with the constitutional position of Northern Ireland, the constitutional statute is the Northern Ireland Act. 
uh, and section one, subsection one of the 1998 Act, directs itself to, to the matter of consent, which I'll come on to a little bit more uh, in, in, a, in a short while. But on that issue of consent, it directs itself to Northern Ireland's position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the United Kingdom. It's about the internal relationships within the United Kingdom. So what's Northern Ireland's relationship with uh, GB, with the rest of the United Kingdom? It says absolutely nothing, and it does not direct itself to the external relationships of the United Kingdom. So comparing consent uh, for the, for example, the protocol, which I'll come on to, with consent for people not voting for Brexit in Northern Ireland is an absolute mischaracterisation, and it finds no basis in, in law or actually the text of the Belfast Agreement. And one of the major issues which is exercising the unionist and loyalist community in Northern Ireland at the minute, and the leaders of all mainstream unionist parties have warned that there's a threat to peace in Northern Ireland. There is... Uh, perpetual instability in the political institutions. Unfortunately, we have seen that manifest itself in violence on the streets, which nobody wants to see. Uh, and these are all the outworkings of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And as I've said, I'm no fan of the Belfast Agreement, uh, but one of the key features in it was that key decisions within the agreement uh, were to be made on a cross-community basis. Uh, and it's uh, st uh, Strand 1, Paragraph 5D, of the Belfast Agreement directs itself towards key decisions uh, are to be made on a cross-community basis, and that then finds uh, its feet in the, in the Northern Ireland Act in, in similar terms. But when it came to the key decision about the implementation of the protocol, the government unilaterally amended the Belfast Agreement, the insert Section 56A and Schedule 6A, to disapply cross-community consent. So for people in my community who has feel the Belfast Agreement has been uh, used against us, and we have been expected to participate in it for the last two decades. When the point came that unionism needed to utilize across community protections uh, for something that we opposed, the cross community protections were unilaterally disapplied. Uh, and the government can make whatever argument they want about that, uh, and the argument they make is they say, well, it's not a devolved issue. In the first instance, uh, there's nothing in the 1998 Act, nor the, the Belfast Agreement, which says key decisions are only devolved decisions. It directs itself to a matter uh, which is, is coming before the Assembly. So that has caused a, a grave imbalance. And separately on the protocol, the High Court in the first challenge to the Northern Ireland Protocol found the Acts of Union, and the Acts of Union as a legal construct is the Union, had been repealed by the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Lawmaking powers over Northern Ireland uh, in some aspects of our laws are handed over to the EU and the European Court of Justice uh, is given jurisdiction over Northern Ireland. Now, whenever unionists, uh, and if anybody has an opportunity to go and read it, one of the most prominent loyalists, he, he was a former loyalist prisoner who became a peacemaker, uh, stretched himself for peace, a man called Billy Hutchison, uh, and became one of the most ardent advocates for peace and one of the people who went into loyalist communities and sold the Belfast Agreement. He, this man is uh, an absolute evangelist for the Belfast Agreement. And this week he published uh, an extensive paper in which he said he felt he could no longer support the Belfast Agreement because of the outworkings of that. Now, when you have a man who was the evangelist for it, who went into these communities and sold this agreement, even saying that the protocol has upended it, that should cause many people uh, cause for concern. Because when people like Billy Hutchison and other people a lot older than me uh, in, in 1998, when they went out to sell this agreement, they sold it on the basis of the principle of consent that the union was safe. But the principle of consent for unionism has to be more than merely symbolic. It has to be more than simply severing the last tie. Because if you can dismantle the acts of union, which is the union, if you can hand lawmaking powers to Brussels, and you could hand jurisdiction to the European Court of Justice, then you could equally hand law-making powers to Dublin, and you could equally make the Irish Court supreme over areas of Northern Ireland law. And if that doesn't trigger the principle of consent, then the principle of consent is a deceptive snare for unionism. And, and the, the constructive ambiguity which has allowed the Belfast Agreement and the process to advance has been flushed out by the protocol, and that is the, the crux of the basis of the issues we now face. Because you have two communities, each who believe they signed up to something else. 
The unionist community believed they signed up to a settlement in 1998 with a principle of consent that protected the substance of the union. And what that means, you can't simply change everything but the last thing. It's not only about the last line of the union flag. Nationalism believes that they signed up to a process which was about incrementally advancing at their objective. I'm not sure how those two different interpretations can be reconciled, and I think what Brexit has done has brought that to the fore. Uh, and just finally, I think in, in, in the days ahead, Northern Ireland is in a difficult place. Uh, at the moment, there is political instability. There is instability and societal difficulties on the street, and I do think it's incumbent on the, the British government to take steps to trigger Article 16 in order to deal with that. They are the safeguards within the protocol. Uh, I don't support any of the protocol. I would wish it all away tomorrow. But Article 16 is within the protocol, uh, and the government have a right to trigger it to protect Northern Ireland's place uh, within uh, the United Kingdom. So as 100 years of Northern Ireland 2021, uh, I hope I'm facing into another 100 years uh, of Northern Ireland. Uh, and again, I would just like to thank everybody who's come along today, the people watching, uh, and especially uh, thank you to the organizers for your invitation and the fantastic hospitality uh, when, when we have been here. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks. Um, and next, we, get, we will have um, Emma Little Pengelly, who is a pro-union commentator, writer, and practicing barrister uh, with a particular interest in constitutional law. She is here today on behalf of the DUP and has served as both MP and an MLA for South Belfast. And Emma was a junior minister in the Northern Ireland government and she has been a negotiator for the DUP for the last 14 years and was a special advisor to three first ministers of Northern Ireland. She has previously lectured in law at Queen's University Belfast and Ulster University, uh, including in EU law and institutions. Um, firstly, can I say thank you to Marissa and thank you to the organizers of this um, conference. And I know that we are in the closing moments of that conference and, and thank you for everybody who's taken the time to come and, and to listen to our reflections about Northern Ireland today. What an incredible honor it is to stand here in this beautiful place to talk about my home and to reflect on the 100 years of Northern Ireland. In 2021, Northern Ireland has marked it's a hundred year centenary. Now that may not seem like a lot to many, but actually the incredible struggle and endurance that it took to get us to this point should provide an opportunity for reflection and thought. I'm incredibly proud of my home. I'm incredibly proud to say that I am from Northern Ireland. When Marissa reached out about coming here today, she said to me um, that the speakers of the panel would have about five minutes each to, to make some comments. And she said, like, you know, pick something that you're interested in. Now, if anybody knows me, they will know there is very little that I can say in just five minutes. <laughs> so therefore, um, I thought, like, I'm not going to stand here today and try to give you any kind of uh, in-depth treaties in terms of what I believe and what I think. But what I wanted to do um, because I do want um, there to be a lot of opportunity for questions and for discussion. But what I wanted to do today is just to um, speak on, on a couple of very short points. The centenary of Northern Ireland has been marked, I suppose, by some controversy. Even within our panel today, and you've heard many different um, ideas and thoughts about what is important to people. There is much that divides us in Northern Ireland, not least language. And when I was asked to come here and speak today, um, the topic was the partition of Ireland. That is not what I would call um, the centenary year. And for, for many unionists like me, this is actually a celebration of the creation of Northern Ireland. It's a hundred years of the creation of my home and a place that I love. But I also acknowledge that for others, it is a hundred years of partition. It's a hundred years of what they will see as separation and of division. I think the really important thing to reflect on here, though, 
And I've heard it said many times over the course of this year that the partition of Ireland created division. The partition of Ireland um, was a hurtful thing. We need to reflect on that. We need to reflect on where we're going to go to and the different aspirations that we have. But what I would say is that the partition of Ireland did not create division. The partition of Ireland, the creation of Northern Ireland, reflected the deep divisions that existed within the island of Ireland at that time. It reflected the fact that when the discussions were underway about what was going to happen in the future of Ireland, there were over a million people who identified as British, who came from generations of people who had made their home in Ireland and Northern Ireland. It reflected the fact that those people cherished their links to the United Kingdom. They wanted to maintain those links. And for those people, the creation of the new Northern Ireland, the success of the negotiations to keep that part of Ireland within the United Kingdom was something to be celebrated. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about 2021 has been a lot of talk about reflection, a lot of talk about stepping back and look about our hopes for the future, and I, and I absolutely agree with that, and I think, and hopefully today we will do that. But what has been absent is that sense of people like me who want to celebrate the fact that my home place is 100 in 2021, to celebrate all that we have achieved, all that we have endured, because it has been difficult. But it's also an opportunity for us, I think, no matter what our political aspirations are, to take the opportunity to say, what do we want for the future? What is our hope for our children? What are our ambitions for what I want Northern Ireland to be over the next 100 years? And I actually think that much of the last 100 years, as difficult as it has been, has been very much focused on the differences that we have what divides us. And yet I think 2021 provides the opportunity for us to say, what is it that we have in common? What is it that we can do to work towards? And I, I actually think this, having worked in politics in Northern Ireland for over the last 15 years, I know there is so much more that we have in common than actually what divides us. Because I know that we want to collectively build a better, brighter future for our young people. I know from talking to people right across the different communities that actually we all do not want our children to experience what we experienced. We came through, particularly over the troubles in the last number of decades, an incredibly difficult, damaging, hurtful pro process. The memories that I have and many of us have scar us deeply. And I know that there isn't a person on this panel, that there isn't a person in Northern Ireland that would want their children and their grandchildren and anybody else's children and grandchildren to experience that fear, the trauma, the loss and the tears. And we still see them in Northern Ireland. I, on a weekly basis, speak to people who shed tears for their children, for their partner, for their parents, killed because of what divides us. So what I would say here today, and I hope to explore some of these themes and some picked up by the panel members in the course of the Q&A, but what I would say is that yes, let's take the opportunity in this beautiful space, uh, but over the course of 2021, what's remaining of it, and into the first year of what I would like to see as the next centenary, the next 100 years of Northern Ireland. But let's take that opportunity to work collectively and commit. What is it that we can do to create stability, to build that better future, to make sure that the lives that our children and grandchildren live in Northern Ireland is so much better than what we experienced. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, and now I'm going to call on Jonathan Tong. Um, John is a professor of political science at Liverpool University. 
He's the author of book studies of Sinn Féin, the SDLP, the DUP and the UUP. He's also a regular media commentator and columnist at the Belfast Telegraph. Thank you very much, uh, Marisa. Thank you to all the organisers, Mike, uh, Richard, uh, for your very generous hospitality. It's wonderful to be here in such a hugely impressive cathedral, uh, as Emma has outlined. And my contribution uh, will be unique this afternoon because I will keep to five minutes. Uh, my, I've got one simple task here. Uh, my job is to unite the unionists, the nationalists, the loyalists and republicans on the panel uh, in opposition to the Englishman telling them where, where Northern Ireland is at. Uh, beyond that, I want to just make a few reflections on, because the title of the panel is Northern Ireland after 100 years. And what I want to look at is, is not so much dwell on the controversies of the past, important though they are, but look at whether Northern Ireland will get another 100 years. The, the question that's also begged in the title of the panel is, is prospects for, for peace. Notwithstanding the disquiet within loyalist communities, which Jamie has outlined, I'm pretty optimistic about the prospects for peace. I think what's remarkable is how well the peace has held uh, since the Good Friday Agreement, or Belfast Agreement if you prefer, of 1998. When you think of the compromises that were involved in that deal, it is remarkable. It is one of the most successful peace deals whether you call it a settlement or whether you call it uh, a process, uh, again, as, as Jamie outlined, you know, the point about it is it has held pretty well. And if you think of the difficult compromises of that deal, whether it be on uh, prison releases, whether it be on policing changes, whether it be on uh, you know, the principle of consent, the principle of northern consent, which the Republicans had to swallow, what's been remarkable is how much violence has been marginalised uh, since that deal. So, in terms of prospect for peace, I think we can be optimistic. In terms of the prospect for politics, though, that is obviously more problematic because, you know, we're in a situation where the institutions that were created by the Good Friday Agreement are in difficulty, there is perpetual instability, there is a case for reforming those institutions, and there probably isn't consent over how to reform those institutions nearly a quarter of a century on from the Good Friday Agreement. So it's there, I see the political difficulties rather than these being now necessarily issues of peace or war, notwithstanding, like I say, the unrest uh, within some loyalist communities at the moment. So what's the long-term political future for Northern Ireland? Has it got one? Um, or you know, will it thrive? And will it need advances in medical science for us all here to see a, a united island? Well, if you look at the recent Lucid Talk uh, poll, that asked the question of, I, think, I can't remember how many thousand respondents it was, do you think Northern Ireland will be around in a decade? And the answer was yes. So people do see at least having a short-term future. But once we got to 25 years, people were far less certain. In fact, there was a slight majority against it. And very few saw Northern Ireland as having a future after 50 years. So one might think, well, you know, we, we won't be talking about Northern Ireland. If we have a forum like this in 100 years, it will be about Ireland since unity rather than Ireland uh, since partition. But there's still work to be done and there's still an awful lot to play for. And thank goodness it's being played out now in a political arena. If you look at the, I did a couple of weeks ago, a poll of polls on the constitutional future of Northern Ireland. And support for Irish unity within the North came at around 38, 39%. Uh, and support for Northern Ireland remaining in the UK was a majority, albeit an unconvincing one, around 50, 51 percent. That's the poll of polls. That's taken every single poll since the Brexit referendum. So Brexit, whilst it's clearly led to political convulsions in, in Northern Ireland in terms of uncertainty and has made potentially a United Ireland a more attractive prospect for some, for some people, it hasn't shifted the dial quite as much as some people might have thought. And I've heard the president of Sinn Féin speaking at the University of Liverpool, Mary Lou Macdonald, saying there's nothing inevitable about a United Ireland. It has to be worked for. And so what I think the political action will be over the next few years in Northern Ireland will be working on that big community who describe themselves as others, who don't identify as unionist or nationalist. And they can too often be written out of the script by this binary perception of Northern Ireland as unionist versus nationalist. There's an increasing percentage of the population who don't identify with either of those labels. That's reflected partly but very much incompletely by the growth in support for 
the centre ground party, the main centre ground party alliance in recent years. They are constitutional agnostics, and it's those people that have to be won over by advocates of the case for the union and the case for an indivisible republic. And so the question I'd throw, and it's thrown back at, at all the panel members, is, is either side actually doing enough to address those others in presenting their case? Because if you look at the pro-union vote, it's larger, if you look at that poll of polls, than is represented by the sum total of the vote for unionist parties. So are unionist parties really good advocates of the union, or are they actually not very good advocates of the union? And then to Republicans, the challenge is, what are you doing to persuade those centre ground voters that the Republic really is the best? And I'm sure that the answer would come back, look, we want conversations about unity. The problem is that not everyone will engage in those conversations. So there has to be a step back and to think, well, how do we get them to engage in conversations about unity? But to finish on an optimistic note and to keep within the, the five minutes-ish uh, that I did promise, you know, in terms of prospects for peace, the title of this thing, I don't think they've ever been as good. The last century that Emma referred to in her talk was one where you had either very sullen politics, the politics of abstention, you had a civil rights campaign which came under attack, and you had a campaign of armed violence. And hopefully, the rest of this century won't involve any of those things. You'll have the politics of participation and reasoned argument in determining the constitutional future of Ireland, North and South. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Uh, we're now going to open it up to a question and answer session. Um, so if, if anyone has a question, if you just want to raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you. M Marissa, if we could please take the two questions that are online first. Okay. Well, whilst I'm here, I'll, I'll read them out. Okay. Uh, and the people asking these questions may be known to the panellists. The first question is from Shane Reynolds, uh, who asks uh, to all the panellists whether they envisage um, partition and Northern Ireland lasting another 100 years and what do they hope things will look like in 100 years time and what efforts are they making to ensure their vision is inclusive of those with a different perspective gosh there's three questions there and then also one from Brona Lawson who is from the uh, Belfast Media Group um, she's an arts columnist um, she's interested in panellists views on how art is one of the most important parts of how peace is built which I think actually is a direct quote from what Justin Welby said here yesterday. Uh, and she's interested to know how panellists uh, support work of artists um, and whether you've gone to see the Are Collective, uh, which is actually the Belfast selection in the Turner Prize here in the Herbert Art Gallery as part of UK City of Culture. And sorry to hear it, I'm not sorry, actually, here's a third question from Geeta Sagal, uh, who's in India. Uh, is there any common ground between the different panellists that all the people of Northern Ireland uh, have been let down by Brexit and the deal done on that? Uh, that's a fairly generic question, um, but there's three questions there. Okay, thanks, Richard. Uh, Colin, would you like to go first? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> there's a, a lot of questions there, trying to even just write them down, and uh, never mind get, get some, some thoughts. Well, I, I think... The first question from Shane where he asks about where, where we think we'll be in 100 years time or where we want to be, I think we'll find the answers will fall pretty much along the lines of, of our different persuasions. Um, I'm an, an Irish nationalist, so therefore I want to see um, that united Ireland. And I think that you know, in terms of whether that is going to, to happen or not, I, I think you know, we can look at the, the polls that, that John has referred to. If the polls were sporadic and going up and going down about the question of whether there would be um, a, a United Ireland or a New Ireland, I, I think that you could be wondering about that, but they're not sporadic. They're consistent and they're consistently moving um, in, a, in one direction. And I think that Many people um, back at home uh, and those that would be uh, from, from an Irish nationalist perspective would have always made remarks like, in our lifetime, we may see uh, a new Ireland, that that's something that would be um, in a distance, 
um, but that it was achievable and that it was um, inevitable in a sort of medium term, maybe 30 years or 40 years. But Brexit completely changed that. Um, Brexit woke within people um, that maybe before that were not really particularly um, cognizant of their, their national identity or where they stood on particular issues, all of a sudden had a really strong view on that. Uh, and, and for many, that would be within uh, wanting to remain part of the European Union. They see the pathway to being part of the, and remaining part of the European Union is to move towards that new Ireland, to, to, to have a united Ireland, and then they can be part of, of that European Union. And remember as well that, albeit that the, the vote was taken on a UK-wide basis, in Northern Ireland, the vote, the majority vote, was to remain part of the European Union. So if you put those alongside each other um, and are making particular broad stroke uh, observations, if the majority people wanted to be part um, of the European Union, the way to achieve that is through a united Ireland. And the, the polls are showing that that is increasingly what people are thinking. Then I think that inevitability of 50 years down the line has come much, much closer. And actually, you can see that within the nationalist um, parties that the conversation has moved from it being a concept to being how do we actually deliver that in that shorter term and how do we work, reach out and work with the unionist community, work with those that do not want to see that united Ireland. How do we work with them so that they have their place in that new Ireland? How do they have their views, their culture um, and their traditions protected as part of that? Um, because that inevitability is, is on its way uh, and we have to work with each other uh, to make sure that as many as possible can join that. So I'll, I'll leave it there because there's, there's about six questions, but I, that's only one. So. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Sorry for throwing you in at the deep end there first. Uh, Jamie, I'll pass over to you. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll not deal with all three questions, you know, uh, uh, just to come back to some of the points that Colin made. I mean, there's nothing inevitable uh, at all uh, about a united Ireland. Uh, those of us who are unionists, unionist, myself and Emma, uh, on the panel today will be wanting, well, I'm sure me and Emma won't be around in, a, in another 100 years, but uh, we, hope, we hope that Northern Ireland will be. Um, so this, there is a notion, uh, and it's, it's well perpetuated by, by nationalist parties, that there's an, an inevitability about a united Ireland and, and unionism uh, should just wake up and get on board and let's have these discussions. I mean, why any unionist would be having a discussion about a united Ireland is, 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 is beyond me. Uh, because I've yet to see any nationalist genuinely deciding that they would like to have a conversation about how they're going to how we may stay in the United Kingdom. In fact, the conversations always have to be unionists uh, essentially entering into conversations about ending the union. I mean, that's an act of constitutional self-harm. And, and, and then when unionists uh, don't want to engage in those conversations, we are presented as regressive, we are presented uh, as people who don't want to engage, as negative, and that negativity maybe then plays out electorally as well because unionism is 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 treated that way. So um, I think unionism need to find a way of dealing with that and more positively coming out and selling the case for the union. But selling the case for the union absolutely uh, does not involve entering into discussions about the United Ireland, the New Ireland, or whatever type of Ireland they want to call it. Unionists want to remain within the United Kingdom. And again, I just finally have to, again, identify the point that uh, whatever about how many people voted in, in Northern Ireland, the majority in relation to the European Union, is an absolutely moot point. The United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. Nothing in the Belfast Agreement or any other agreement directs itself towards the uh, external relationships of the United Kingdom. So if nationalism wanted that to play a part, they would first need to leave the United Kingdom. Uh, things are a little bit back to thunt uh, with, with, with that argument. So it, it's very important, and especially for a GB audience, I think sometimes that's misunderstood, uh, that actually... Uh, if we follow the logical conclusion and we're going to start, start dividing up constituent parts of the United Kingdom as to who voted leave and who voted remain, I mean, you know, will we put London in one camp, will we put Manchester in another and Belfast in another? I mean, where does the nonsense end? Uh, the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union and the whole United Kingdom should leave the European Union and the problem we have at the minute is that the whole United Kingdom have not left the European Union because Northern Ireland has been left subjugated into what effectively amounts to uh, an economic United Ireland. Thanks, Jamie. Emma? 
Um, I, I agree with much of what has been said um, by Jamie there. I think what is happening um, in Northern Ireland and I think in, in the Republic of Ireland as well at the moment is a very deliberate attempt to try to reframe the conversation about um, uh, United Ireland, as it's called, so the, the, the destruction uh, and the getting rid of the, the state of Northern Ireland and having a political union um, north and south. So I, there's certainly a bit of a campaign around trying to frame it as an inevitability, as Jamie has said. I don't believe it's inevitability at all. Um, such a thing would create a huge amount of transition, of change, of instability. Um, I always say if, if people think that Brexit was difficult and leaving the European Union, um, which had only really been integrated with um, since, what, 1973, can you imagine trying to unpick literally hundreds of years of Northern Ireland being deeply embedded within the uh, United Kingdom? Um, I think it's an incredibly difficult thing um, and that hasn't been explored. But certainly what's happening is that people want to frame this as an inevitable thing and they want to shift the discussion into not the if, but the how and the when. And of course, that's, that's fair enough. You know, that's um, very much in line with what those who aspire to um, that outcome would want us to do. Um, but ultimately for me as a unionist, I believe the future um, of Northern Ireland is better served as part of this United Kingdom. I think that that makes economic sense, it makes political sense, it makes cultural sense, and it is a case that we have to make. But when people say to me, why don't you join as a unionist into a conversation about what a new Ireland will look like, I would say, well look, as Jamie has indicated, why would I do that? Because that is not an outcome or an objective that I want, it is not an objective that I think is inevitable. But likewise, I would offer the, an extended invitation to all on the panel to engage in a conversation about how we make the union stronger, because that's where I believe the future should be. Um, that is what I want to achieve. And I, you may well say, I'm not engaging in that, um, and that might be understandable. But I think likewise, then you can't say, oh, unionists are wrong not to engage with us on what a united Ireland might look like. Look, we've got different political objectives. I don't think it's inevitable. I think the case for the union is incredible. It's strong. We do need to get out there. We need to make it. I think unionists are very conscious of that. Thanks, Emma. John? Uh, just very briefly, uh, the question from Shane Reynolds was, will partition still be in place in 100 years? Probably not, I'd say, but it's, it's not inevitable. Uh, I agree with Colin that the Brexit referendum has made the United Ireland a little bit more likely, not because unionists are waking up now and thinking, well, actually, I'm quite sympathetic to the nationalist cause and I wouldn't mind a United Ireland. Far from it. It's that centre ground vote that is bigger and is, a more, is more amenable to persuasion. So that's where, if there is going to be change, that's the, the target constituency for Republicans. In terms of what Jamie and, and, and Emma said, I agree to, to some extent. Why would unionists engage in discussions about a United Ireland because you don't want to build a prospectus for something that you, you don't want to buy into. So I understand the logic of refusing to take part. Where I disagree with them is where they say, well, nationalists never take part in uh, discussions about Northern Ireland and the Union. Nationalists do that every day. They discuss structures of governance at Stormham. They are helping to manage the Union in the short term, whilst not by any means giving up on their longer term constitutional aspirations. So the parallel, I'd argue, is somewhat inexact. And we haven't answered the question about art either. Just one thing on, on the question on, on art, sorry. Uh, just on the street art, it's very interesting the way that murals have changed over the years. And I think one of the interesting questions is whether that has led change on the ground or whether it simply reflect, reflected change uh, in terms of the street art that you see in, in places like Belfast. Sorry. Thanks, John. Chris? Yeah, um, well, I suppose I, I don't mean to be flippant by saying this when I, when I start, but the, sure, the one sure thing that we all face is we won't be building the United Ireland on a dead planet. Um, and the, the one thing that anybody wants to do when they're looking at political change and constitutional change going forward is we need to get very serious very, very quickly um, about the political and economic um, systems that w w we want. And the constitutional chips have been thrown in the air. It is inevitable that they're going to fall. And I think as John and others have pointed out, there's no inevitability to, to what side up they fall or how things are going to look. But these islands are going to look very, very different. Um, in, in the years ahead. You know, it's no surprise. I want to see a really vibrant civic conversation started. I want to see the Irish government play a leading role in that. 
um, I, I think it was really the, the, the influence of the Scottish government um, and the weight of the institutional expertise that was able to, to, to drive that debate. So, for example, when the Edinburgh Agreement was signed in 2012, saying that there would be a Scottish referendum in 14, you know, support for Scottish independence was hovering around the mid-20s. Whenever the conversation started, whenever the you know those undecideds were able to get involved in that conversation, there was a real rise in support. And I'm certainly a believer that that will be the case when it comes to Irish unity. When it comes to the question around you know r respecting those who maybe don't believe in that, or those people who are worried about their their future in a reunified Ireland, I think it's really important. And you know, my party leader spoke re very recently about ensuring. That the orange and you know our flag is is made of the green and the orange and the, and the white obviously of the long-term peace between the two traditions on our island. But one of the things I like to point out too is there's more new Irish now in Ireland. There's more foreign nationals living in Ireland than there is unionists uh, in the north, and I think we need to be cognizant of that. There there are people living in Ireland today because of humanitarian crises everywhere else, um, and we need to bear that in mind that this new Ireland is going to be very very different from the one that has been discussed for the last 10, 15, 20 years, even by um, Republicans and that. Uh, and we, th we need to, to bear that in mind. When it comes to art, and I, I maybe widen it out to, to public spaces and civic conversations, and I think what we've seen in both Scotland and Wales in recent times is testament to the, to the role of public space, to the role of that civic conversation. You know, the establishment of Yes Kimru um, in 2016, you know, up until about two years ago, it had about 2,000 members. Over COVID, it has now jumped to 20,000, you know, civic activists and people who come from the civic space are making the case for increased Welsh sovereignty and um, ultimately Welsh independence. And I think that's where the public space is. I also think that the public space, especially art uh, and that forum, is where people from all identities and all sides in this debate can have that safe space to be able to to be able to put out their their message, but I think at the core of this is an understanding that you know this constitutional debate is part of a far wider, um, some would say more important debate when it comes to you know mitigating climate catastrophe, but it's part of a conversation that unfortunately not enough people are having. But increasingly now with Brexit, and we've seen Brexit has showed us how not to do things, and I think the key lesson for all of this is we have to talk, we need to thrash it out, otherwise the the feelings on the other side just aren't bearing with. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thanks to all of you. Have we got any more questions? I think we'll yes, take maybe three. We'll take some from here in the cathedral, Mercer. Thanks, Chris. Uh, John. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Uh, John Blundell, I'm a local councillor in Coventry. Um, I found it really interesting because when you look at the United Kingdom, if you go back with the Act of Union in 1707 when Scotland joined the Union, and then obviously there's a sort of a movement now in Scotland for sort of independence. And then of course in 1800, Ireland, it became the United Kingdom of Great Britain and, uh, and, and Ireland, of course. And then in 1920, that was when the, part, uh, the, the separation happened. But I, I mean, I'm just sort of wondering, the government of the day, I don't know much about Lloyd George's government and, and how they sort of dealt with uh, when it became uh, necessary to separate Ireland. But sometimes I think maybe the RSC is a bit of an impediment. I mean, it's two separate nations, but it can still be two nations. It can still be nations within a United Kingdom. And then, of course, we've got the United Kingdom has now come out of the European Union. So these things sort of evolve. And I just sort of wondered what the sort of a panel's thoughts were about. There's nothing set in stone about the countries that make up the United Kingdom. And I would subscribe to the view that in a hundred years time the United Kingdom may well look different to the way that it does now but none of us are going to know uh, unless we suddenly find the gift of immortality as to what uh, things are going to look like in a hundred years so that's my sort of thoughts is that it, it's a it's a dynamic it's slow changing but it is dynamic and any one of you may well be right on the panel about the way things are going to happen in the future but uh, I just wondered what your sort of thoughts were about how, how the British government should react to you know, what's happening in, in Northern Ireland, in, in Ireland at the moment. 
and uh, how to sort of it, it's ensuring that the the way forward is peaceful uh, and there's no sort of conflict uh, that's my that's my question thank you thank you john oh uh, yes we have uh, if I take one question over here, and then I'll come back. I know our last one will be with Professor Hardy. Hiya. I, I'm just um, asking a question. Bear with me. Um, what do you think about the hate crimes between the Republican and the Unionists? And is there anything you were going to help to stop this? And also, do you have any um, background of your own... Um, like hate crimes that you've been dealt with. Thank you. Gosh, lots of questions. Here we go. Hello, uh, Jenny Ratcliffe, uh, PhD student. Um, I'm interested in the first point that was raised in the panel around the role of trust in peace. Um, and I wondered if anybody could offer some reflections on uh, what needs to happen next in terms of um, trust building both um, at the domestic level but actually also um, at the international level with uh, neighbours uh, on a political platform. Thank you. Marissa, I hope you're keeping note of all these questions. Uh, I have, I'll try and take uh, two more. Thank you. My name is Tony McNally. At three years of age, I was a refugee from Northern Ireland where my family were in Cookstown and were driven out because they're associated with the uh, Republican and Catholic uh, community. And we crossed uh, uh, over uh, from Belfast to, to Holyhead then and the cattle boats. We were refugees from our country uh, uh, of Ireland, but I listened to the Unionists who I consider as friends as much as uh, Sinn Féin, as friends of, uh, of Ireland. But the, when you say you celebrate 100 years of the Northern Ireland state, in fact it was established under force as an apartheid regime that discriminated from the outset against the Catholic minority, starting with a pogrom virtually on the first days of the operation and went through the 60 years uh, of that and you've made no reference of apology uh, to that establishment of the state including the, the uh, uh, discrimination in elections so that the unionists use the slogan vote often vote early because they could some of them could have up to six votes and when my family m were in the march from Cull Island to Dungannon on the civil rights march for the rights of housing allocations, which were discriminated against the Catholics, or in going in marching into Derry and being shot as civilians for demanding their civil rights. You've made no apology or no concession when you're celebrating 20, uh, uh, all those years, 100 years of this apartheid state up until the Good Friday Agreement managed to clear that away and try to build a fully democratic uh, statelet and also ultimately uh, with the option of the majority of people in Northern Ireland staying within the European Union. We have one final question, I think. So thank you and thank you for your patience for five or six questions to, to manage. I, I, I wanted to start firstly with a thank you. This is exactly, and you are a tremendous uh, example of what Rising uh, as a forum is. It's about sharing views, about expressing the challenges that we face. And it's not always about um, solutions. It's about raising awareness. And I think the ability to voice emotion and uh, passion is important too. My question though is, a, my interest now, my research interest is, is at a higher level. I'm interested in global governance. And I'm thinking, just for your, your thoughts, in 1907, H.G. Wells wrote this amazing forecast book of War of the Worlds. And he saw a world in which 
it suddenly rethought itself in terms of global governance when it was facing an existential threat, in that case from Martians. Well, in Glasgow at the moment, we are discussing an existential threat. And I wondered how you'd put the passions and the concerns, the foci that you have, and you've been so articulate with, in the context of that. So when we look forward 50 years, we might not be here at all. We might not be here in the same form. And some of the local issues that cause us huge concern and emotional concern will be in a completely different place. So I'd be interested in your response to that. Thanks, Mike. And thanks for all those questions. Um, I think Jamie wants to respond first. Yeah, uh, I, suppose he, I suppose each of us won't deal with all the five questions, but we'll take one or two each. Um, look, uh, to come back to the point uh, about Northern Ireland, uh, I, I do celebrate uh, 100 years of Northern Ireland, uh, my country, uh, as did Emma, made the point very forcefully, I think we're right and we're entitled to do so. Um, and I mean, there's this notion that it always has to be unionism who are apologising and unionism who are saying sorry. There's very few apologies coming to my community. I mean, just a couple of days ago was the anniversary of the Anniskillen bombing, where men, women and children were blown to pieces while they started a war memorial. I think of Le Mans, I think of the Shankill bomb, when nine uh, people were murdered uh, by the RLA. So if, when we're talking about apologies, I think everybody, and, and, and when the loyalist organizations, uh, the loyalist paramilitary organizations called the ceasefire in 1994, uh, the first loyalist prisoner of the, the Troubles read that ceasefire, a man called Gusty Spence. Uh, and Gusty Spence expressed abject and true the morsh uh, to all innocent victims of the Troubles. Uh, and I think he, he, he spoke for all loyalists when he said that. And I think that even my generation of loyalists would, would subscribe uh, to that. So, so loyalism and unionism has stepped up in that regard. Uh, I think Gusty Spence also put it that uh, everybody has to say sorry to each other. Uh, but there is an art of that it's always my community, it's always unionism and loyalism, that we have to say sorry, we are perpetually the bad guys, uh, and we're just not prepared to accept it anymore. Uh, and it's, it, it's time that our community started to, metaphorically, in a political sense, uh, fight back and sell our message, because there's been a lot of wrongs done uh, within uh, my community, the place where Emma grew up, Market Hill, was bombed. You know, Emma has all those experiences as well, what she went through, what her family went through. So, I mean, we aren't uh, bad people who should be apologizing for the sins of people that went before. We are proud unionists, uh, but who could have many grievances ourselves if we wish to go down that path. And finally, in relation to what needs to be done, I think it was the first question, uh, Article 16 needs to be triggered. Uh, the acts of union need to be restored. That means putting Northern Ireland back into the UK internal market. Uh, that means taking Northern Ireland out of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice and out of uh, taking, uh, being an EU rule taker and law taker. And the whole United Kingdom has to be uh, on an equal footing because that's the very basis of equal citizenship. Thank you, Jamie. Um, does any of the other panelists want to go next? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to follow on from, from what Jamie has said there. Um, I think there's a lot of false narratives out there about the creation of Northern Ireland and the partition of, of Ireland. I think when you look back, you, you, you should reflect on the fact that it was Irish nationalism wanting at that stage to leave the United Kingdom. Um, that was the change. Um, that was the change that was um, asked for. Um, but in that context, as I indicated in my initial remarks, there were over a million British um, in Ireland, mainly in the, the Ulster region, many of whom had sacrificed a huge amount, not least in the First World War, um, while those negotiations were, were underway. And the reality was that the government of the day listened to that dynamic. I think that when people talk about partition creating division, and, and I indicated those divisions were there. Um, a huge um, British uh, um, community in Ireland. They did not want to be dragged out um, with the rest of Ireland from the United Kingdom. They cherished the United Kingdom. But also, I think that the government of the day in terms of, and we have to remember that the negotiation around the Government of Ireland Act was not a straightforward thing. There was a lot of horse trading, there were a lot of amendments to that. It was a very complicated process of negotiation. Um, various interests were making uh, their case. Um, but of course, one of the things that they would have considered at that time 
was to, for if they forced over a million of those people um, away from the United Kingdom after years of service in the preceding decade in the First World War, never mind beyond that, I think there would have undoubtedly been huge civil war in Ireland. So the idea that if there hadn't have been this partition, we would have been living in some sort of, what is it they call it, sunny uplands of a utopia, is a complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. I think it is inevitable that there would be um, a civil war at that time. And the government were logically trying to avoid that by listening to the democratic will in that region. I think when you look then at the creation of Northern Ireland, I hear what you say in terms of the franchise. That was not unique to Northern Ireland. That was very common right across Ireland and uh, Great Britain and across the world in terms of local government franchise and everything else. And it's, 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 it's not the time to get into the detail of that, but it was common and remained, of course, in the Republic of Ireland um, for, for decades and decades beyond the creation uh, of Northern Ireland. But it's also undoubtedly the case, undoubtedly regardless of the franchise issue, that the democratic majority in Northern Ireland wanted to remain in the United Kingdom. And we talk a lot about the Belfast Agreement. But the Belfast Agreement, and there are many, many aspects of that that I disagreed with, including the release of terrorist prisoners and other aspects, which meant that uh, I didn't support, um, support it. But as Jamie said, I supported peace. But one of the key things about the Belfast Agreement was to try to put to bed this delegitimizing Northern Ireland. It tried to say and get all of the parties, and the parties did sign up to this, we're, trying to see, we're now seeing a rollback from that of course, but the parties signed up to a recognition of A, the legal reality of the entity of Northern Ireland, they signed up to, and, and this is actually, a lot of people talk about what's in the Belfast Agreement, it's not in it at all, of course, but it's actually in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement that the parties would recognise the legitimacy that the majority of people within Northern Ireland wants to remain within the United Kingdom. And until that changes, that the, the, the Northern Ireland in its entirety would remain within the United Kingdom. And that's the actual words of the Belfast Agreement. And to touch on what Jamie has said, the problem with the protocol, the problem with the discussions, um, is around this idea of separating Northern Ireland out against the democratic will of the people of Northern Ireland, which was set, uh, voted on in referendum in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, that by stealth, in the protocol, Northern Ireland is being separated away from the rest of the United Kingdom. And it's not just me saying that. You might say, as a unionist, I might say that. The court has said that. The court has said that Article 6, one of the absolutely key things in the very short um, piece of legislation, which is the Act of Union, um, that that has been uh, repealed by implication. That is constitutionally incredibly significant and it's effectively a weakening of those ties by stealth. And from a unionist point of view, from a Belfast Agreement point of view, a St Andrews point of view, that is not acceptable and it's wrong. Because that is not what people voted on, it's not what people signed up to. And I think that is a major problem for the European Union, the Irish government, and for uh, the government of the United Kingdom. And it has to be addressed urgently. Thanks, Emma. Um, I'm going to bring in Colin now. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I suppose I want to maybe talk a bit about that, that issue of an apology uh, and, and the lack of an apology. And maybe. Just, I'd mentioned earlier that I started my, my career before going into politics, before going to the assembly, was as a youth worker. And I always remember very early on, in the first few weeks that I was up in Stormont and, and up on the hill, as we call it, and somebody said to me, do you miss working with all them squabbling youngsters? I said, are you serious? I'm up in the assembly. It's full of squabbling youngsters. And I think the point is that... I remember in my work of trying to bring young people together when they had fell out over whatever the issue was. I thought that if we were going to go down the line of apologies, you were very, very seldom going to get them because the person, in that instance, young people were convinced that what they had done was right and they were convinced that the other person had wronged them. And then likewise, on the other side, the other person thought that they were right and that the other person had wronged them. And I think that once we start to get caught up, and, and I reflect on the, the last two um, contributions, 
that it does, if you start asking for apologies, it evokes a no, because what you did was wrong to me. I think we could look at a process that's maybe more about acknowledging what's happened in the past, but I think we need to create the space where we talk about what we do going forward for the future. And I think the way to get the people around the table to have those conversations and to make Stormont and Up on the Hill not full of squabbling youngsters is to stop looking back the way and demanding some sort of apology for it. And that's difficult. And I think there does need, certainly, within our communities and within our respective communities, that we need to show the leadership that that's not what we're asking the communities to seek. Because if you seek constantly something that you're not going to get, you're only going to be disappointed but it's not going to help us to move forward. And, and in terms of, of the, the issue of trust uh, and how we build trust into it, I think we do that through leadership. Uh, I think we have to do that through communication. I think we have to, again, that word of acknowledgement, we have to acknowledge where other people are. I, I would say that there's very, very few things on the political spectrum that I could agree with Jamie. But I'm prepared to sit beside him on a panel and have a conversation because I hope that that means collectively through what all of us are doing here means that whenever we go back into our communities and speak to the people that we represent that we can normalize talking we can normalize having conversations and that means that we are showing leadership to our community that you don't resolve things by going out and setting fire to buses or lifting a gun and, and shooting people. The point about whether we all have hate crimes and we've been um, had a result of it, we all have our stories. My, my father was caught up in a bomb where a building collapsed around him and he was very, very lucky to come out of it alive. We had a, an, an afternoon and an evening where we thought we had lost him. I had a cousin that was shot dead by the British Army in Belfast. Those things, are what everybody has their story, has their narrative in Northern Ireland, and, and, and that is part of them, it's who they are, but you can't let that eat you up and prevent you from moving forward, because in the future, we do have issues such as climate that we need to be challenging, and we do that through the work that we do on the ground. Yesterday, I had one of the best things that I enjoy doing about my job, in a primary school, working with children who had letters to talk about what they wanted to do in terms and what they wanted to see out of COP26. I got those letters, got straight home, scanned them and sent them to Minister Malin, our party representative and Minister for Infrastructure that is actually in Glasgow. Those young people felt that connection. They are really keen and eager to be able to move forward and discuss issues. And that's how we do it. We, we facilitate and we show that leadership. So I hope I got as many of the questions there as possible. Yes, thanks, Colin. Um, Chris or John? Yeah, no problem. Uh, look, um, the, 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 the French socialist Jean Jaurès says the, most, the first and most important question when it comes to politics is the sovereignty of the people. Um, and I think when we look at climate, I think we need to democratise our politics, we need to democratise our economy, we need to democratise um, how we engage with the earth uh, again. And for me, when we look at that issue of sovereignty, that's when it comes to constitutional politics across uh, these islands. Um, it, it's no surprise to anybody here that, you know, certainly to hear me say this, but I believe that the UK was an imperialist construct. Um, the people of Ireland had every right um, to, to, to struggle for their freedom, um, and we still continue that path, obviously, today. And that's what I want to be involved in, um, certainly un until that is achieved. Um, the question around hate crimes, and if I maybe explore it as sectarianism, Sectarianism was a disease that was stitched into the very fabric of the northern state. You know, the debate about whether it be nine counties, six counties, four counties, all come down to a sectarian headcount. Sectarianism was weaved through the very fabric of the state. It's been with us ever since. Again, and you know, James Connolly pointed out as early as 1914, when partition was mooted, um, that it would lead to a carnival of reaction. Um, that you know, he flagged up that the only losers in all of this would be working people. Uh, they'd be torn asunder, um, and that the you know the, the green and the orange would dominate, and would dominate our politics f for all of the wrong reasons. It is still the same today. Sectarianism remains a boil that needs lanced. Um, we haven't been able to do that. I am a firm believer that you know we need to lance partition to be able to deal with it effectively. Uh, it is only when the island is unified that we will be able to build a truly unified people as well. On the issue of trust and what the British government should do, I think when it comes to this entire constitutional process, the British government should clearly, very clearly spell out 
the parameters of how uh, and why a referendum um, can be held, uh, what, it, what it will take. For example, you know, is it polls that they're watching uh, and a British uh, Secretary of State would make that decision? Ultimately, it would be a Downing Street Prime Minister who would, of course, make that decision. Um, is it elections? Um, you know, there's a lot touted um, about the potential of a Sinn Féin First Minister in Stormont next year. Does that mean that that then meets the, um, the, the threshold for a referendum on, on Irish unity? Nobody knows. The British government won't tell us, so they need to be very clear uh, on what that means. But when it comes to trust, we currently have a British government, and I alluded to this, that's walking away from any sense of good faith, be it on an international stage or even locally. We have a British government who's just about to bring forward legislation on legacy um, that would provide an amnesty much, much worse than what Pinochet ever did uh, in Chile. That's not my words, that was the CHA that uh, made that um, very clear. We have a British government who you know, walks away from international obligations and treaties before the ink is even dry uh, on, on the paper. Uh, and I think even the problems when it came to power sharing over the last number of years was an issue of trust, was an issue of good faith, and um, being able to deliver upon agreements made, whether that be Irish language or, or anything else. Uh, it's very important that when you make an agreement, you stick to an agreement, and uh, power sharing is not going to work uh, unless that is the case. But I think, in, in, and I think it was Tony, if I got your name right, I think it was made the remarks and flagged it up. You know, we might be in a, a period now of the politics of participation, but we've come out of a century of the politics of domination, of supremacy, um, of division, of violence, um, and we need all of us to fasten a different way forward. Thankfully, we're in that space. And I'm just, finally, I would say, there was an apology in 2002, the IRA issued an unprecedented apology to the civilians um, that were killed in a, uh, on a 30-year conflict. Um, so apologies do play a very important role. The former Prime Minister, David Cameron, apologised for the events on Bloody Sunday. Um, you, know, that had a, you know, that had a really positive experience for many people in Derry. Did it take away all the pain? Of course it didn't, but it did matter. Uh, and I think there is an onus on all of us to look back on the last century, to realise the extreme hurt um, and to commit ourselves that it's not going to be like that in the next hundred years.